Will gluten-free packaged foods sabotage your results on the Walls Protocol? I mean, it's gluten-free. How bad can it really be? You just need a little something for this diet to not feel so strict. So what's a little snack here and there? Let's find out. And spoiler alert, be prepared to be surprised by my response. And my friend, if you want a more personalized approach to creating your MS diet and lifestyle, check out my private coaching program. It includes a comprehensive assessment, personalized strategies, and lifestyle support. Each month, I accept only three new clients. So if you are interested, apply at alleenbrennan.com backslash coach. Now on to today's episode. There are 1 million people diagnosed with multiple sclerosis in the U.S. So that makes you one in a million. And you have a special purpose in this world that no diagnosis can take away from you. So if you are ready to reclaim your body, mind, and life from multiple sclerosis, welcome to my MS podcast. I'm your host, Aileen Brennan. Hello, my friends. I hope you are enjoying season four of my MS podcast, which is all about MS and nutrition. Basically, what's the connection between food and MS or other autoimmune and chronic conditions? And so far, we have covered a broad range of topics. We've touched on everything from the best foods to support brain health, how to eat for better energy how to not feel so deprived on the walls protocol, the five key elements of an anti-inflammatory diet. We touched on intermittent fasting and even eating out on the walls protocol. And the feedback that you have shared has been so incredible. I get messages from you every day and I love hearing from you. So thank you for those emails and DMs. They help me to know like which topics are really resonating with you and what topics you have so that I can keep bringing you the most relevant and valuable information. That's what this is all about. So today's topic was prompted by some of those messages, along with some questions that I've recently been getting with some of my private coaching clients. So as you know, or maybe you didn't, we have new listeners every single week. And if this is your first episode tuning in, Welcome to my MS podcast. I'm so, so glad that you're here. And I hope that you choose to come back every Wednesday for a new episode. But um, if you are new or a veteran here, I have a private coaching um, nutrition practice where I work one-on-one with clients who really need help personalizing the walls protocol to them. Basically, they want to follow the walls protocol, but they're having trouble fitting it in with their lifestyle, their budget, their cravings, all of the things. So they just need somebody to help them make this realistic for them so that they can maintain it. And of course, I also provide the accountability that so many people need to be consistent so that we don't feel so alone in this journey, living with a chronic illness and following the walls protocol. Well, recently I've had several conversations with many of my clients, just like you and I, who are following the walls protocol to manage our diagnosis. And most people have MS, but other people, as I said, are managing other autoimmune and chronic conditions. Bottom line, they want to reduce inflammation in their body so that they can ideally reduce or eliminate symptoms. I mean, that's ultimately what the protocol is designed to do. Food is not a cure. It will not take MS off your medical record. However, it can help you to feel better in your body. It can help you to feel better in your body on a daily basis and give you the energy and health to live and enjoy your life. And I don't know about you, but I don't care what my medical record says. I care how I feel in my body day to day. And am I able to do the things that are most meaningful to me and that bring me joy? That's what I want. (laughs) 
So there is always a deep desire to prevent the diagnosis from progressing, right? Like we have this deep desire to prevent this diagnosis from progressing so that we can still enjoy our life. That is the bottom line. And this desire is often strongest when we are either first diagnosed or when a new symptom pops up. That's when the motivation is highest to follow the protocol to a T. You want results and you will do just about anything to get them. And then there are the days when motivation isn't so high. You still don't want this disease to progress, but there is not an immediate or intense pain point, so to speak. You've just kind of slipped into your new norm. And those are the days when things aren't perfect, but you're likely dealing with some fatigue or brain fog again, just like a gentle little reminder that you have MS or another chronic illness. And you've kind of become adjusted to this as your new norm. And therefore you may be tempted to loosen the reins on the protocol. Because again, there isn't an immediate or intense pain point for you. You're not in the shock of just being newly diagnosed, or there's not like a new symptom or a flare or like something really intense that is screaming at you and creating that undeniable motivation to again, follow this to a T. And when we're tempted to loosen the reins, we start to test the boundaries. How far can you really go without triggering a flare or a new symptom? And this is where the question starts to pop up about gluten-free processed foods. Like, how bad are they? Are they something that I can have? I mean, I'm not eating gluten. Yes, it may be packaged, but I'm at least not eating gluten. And the grocery store certainly isn't short on them. They are exploding with new gluten-free options every single week. There are now entire aisles and corners of the grocery store dedicated to gluten-free products. And I've been getting an increasing number of questions around them. (laughs) Are some better than others? Is there a limit to how many of them I can eat in a day? What are the best brands? And is there anything that I should avoid? So whenever a topic like this pops up and I get lots of questions around one particular area, I want to bring it here on the podcast because it means that those are just a small representation of a bigger community of people who are asking this question. And I also know that sometimes there can be like a little guilt or I would even go as far as to say shame if you want to be following the walls protocol, then feel like you're kind of quote unquote cheating here and there. Um, And then you start to like wonder, can I say that I'm following the walls protocol? I mean, I have some gluten-free packaged products or again, maybe you do have a cheat here and there. Um, I hate to use that term, but you know what I mean when I'm referencing that. And that's not helping anything because the only thing that does is make you feel more alone in this. And if nothing else, I want this episode to help you realize that this is something that a lot of us are struggling with. So you are not alone if this is something that you have been asking yourself or something that you've been dealing with. And maybe you're listening to this episode and you're like, um, Aline, I eat gluten-free packaged foods all the time. I don't have any guilt around them. I'm quite proud of them because I've kicked gluten out of my kitchen. And that to me was a monumental feat. And if you are saying that a thousand percent, I am cheering you on because you are 100% right. That is a big step. And that is a really helpful step with reducing inflammation in your body. So you keep going. I am cheering you on. (laughs) But to dive a little deeper into this topic, I busted out the Walls Protocol book. This is the revised version that Dr. Walls released in March of 2020. And I, at the end of each of the chapters where she talks about the Walls Protocol, well, first of all, there's, um, as we know, three levels of the Walls Protocol, level one, level two, and level three. And I'm going to read straight from the book here. It's on page 172, and it's the Walls Diet at a Glance. So this is kind of like 
the highlight version, um, the cliff note version, if you will, of level one of the walls protocol. So the first thing is to eat nine cups of vegetables and fruits every single day, divided into three leafy green, three sulfur rich, and three deeply colored. Now I've talked about this on previous episodes, so I'm not going to go deep into it here. That's the nine cups is the goal. And keep in mind that Dr. Walls designed this based on her body frame, her level of activity, and her metabolism. So that was the amount of vegetables and fruit that she needed to consume in a day to not only heal her body, but for her to stay full. Now she has said many times over, she even said it when I interviewed here right on this podcast, that the nine cups, they were designed for her. So the goal is to get the majority of the food that you eat in a day to be vegetable and specifically divided among those three categories. If you need to bump it down to six because you're more petite, you have more sedentary lifestyle or whatever the case may be, then you do that, but still get the three different categories And mainly don't say that you can't get the nine cups in. So you reduce it to six, but then you're loading up on all kinds of other foods because you're hungry. So if you're hungry, eat more veggies. (laughs) Point being, The first thing on level one of the laws protocol, eat the nine cups. Next, eat grass-fed or wild-caught meats. And then she has a note in here if you're vegetarian, kind of like what the adaptations are that you need to make. And then lastly, you may eat gluten-free starch like gluten-free grains or potatoes, but try not to overdo it. Ideally, don't have these starchy foods every day. So there's one little note for us to acknowledge, like ideally we're not having starchy foods, which is the base of the majority of gluten-free processed foods. Like they're going to have some type of combination of rice, potato, you know, all those types of things. So that in and of itself is one acknowledgement here. She's saying like you can have some gluten-free starch, but ideally don't have it every day. And then later on in this section, she has forbidden foods, which are all gluten-containing foods, all dairy-containing foods, eggs, um, non-organic soy and rice milk, white sugar, high fructose corn syrup, artificial sweeteners, including soda and diet soda, all trans fat, partially hydrogenated oils. Um, She goes into like the whole vegetable oil thing of corn, soybean, canola, grapeseed, palm kernel, um, and then anything with preservatives or flavor enhancers such as MSG. Biggest takeaways, the majority of your foods should be vegetables. Get those veggies in. And she also said that ideally, you're not having the non-starchy foods every single day. Now, I Again, I go back to if you are brand new to this protocol and you need some stepping stones to try to build up to this, by all means do that. Because the last thing we want is somebody to be discouraged thinking that they have to do all of the to-dos on day one. That is not realistic for the majority of people. Most people, when starting the protocol, are dealing with fatigue and brain fog and overwhelm. I mean, this book alone is really thick and it's really dense with a lot of information. It's why I ran that book club many years back. We went through the book chapter by chapter and it was something that helped to break down such dense information for us so that we could absorb it a little bit easier. Um, But my point here is that if you're not at that stage yet, okay, what can you do today to get one step closer? But I am trying to help us answer the question, what's the deal with the gluten-free packaged foods? Can we have them or can they? Can we not according to the Walls Protocol? And here, at least on level one, she is saying you can have some gluten-free starches, just ideally not every day. Now that's the ideal, but again, there's real life. When someone brings in homemade banana bread into the office or the cookies and the chocolate in the pantry feel like they are calling your name and they won't let up. This is what I think is an important distinction here. What is your typical response in these moments? Is it to walk away feeling empowered that you are choosing your health over momentary flavor of the food? So when somebody brings in that banana bread, are you looking at that and saying like, of course I want a bite of that. It's warm, it's delicious, everyone's raving about it. Of course I want that. But no, I am choosing not to eat it because I know that that will not support my body and I want results. 
I want results. So I am choosing to not eat it right now. So there's one option, like there's one scenario. Scenario two is walking away feeling completely deprived. So scenario one, you're kind of walking away feeling empowered, like I could have it if I wanted. I'm choosing to not eat it. Scenario two is you're walking away. So you're still not eating it. Great. However, you're walking away completely deprived and feeling discouraged because not only do you have MS, but you have to live with this super restrictive diet too. And scenario three, you say, screw it. I'm just eating it. It won't make a difference. I'll start again tomorrow. And maybe you will, or maybe tomorrow will turn into next week, next month, after summer, or in the new year. And that time never comes until a new symptom pops up. And then you're back to square one, but feeling more motivated than ever because now you're dealing with the intense pain point. So which do you find yourself to be in most often? Feeling empowered that you're choosing health over food, feeling deprived and depressed, or feeling like you're gonna live for the moment and turn a blind eye until tomorrow. You know that it's not good for you, But in that moment, you don't care. You'll deal with whatever comes up later. If you're in the first camp, amazing. I salute you. That's the ideal mindset to have. You're acknowledging that you can eat whatever you want, but you're choosing to eat based on the health that you want to create and maintain in your body. Keep going. And if you're in this camp, I want to hear from you. What have you found to be most helpful in developing this mindset? You know, I am always game for a good conversation around mindset. All right. If you are in camp two, feeling deprived and depressed, I highly recommend that you check out season four, episode six. So just a few weeks ago, when I dedicated an entire episode to not feeling deprived on the walls protocol, that would be a fantastic episode for you to check out. And of course, keep listening to this episode because what I'm about to share will be helpful for you as well as that final group that's likely just to throw the protocol to the wind, at least temporarily. And I should also say, again, that this is also relevant for those of you who are just starting out and you wanna make these changes, but you simply need those stepping stones to build up up to the walls protocol. That is quite honestly what I find to be most sustainable for people when they can take small gradual changes that don't overwhelm them. They master one at a time and they build from there. The people that do that are far more successful than the ones that try to achieve perfection. They try to check all of the boxes on day one and then they burn themselves out so quickly. So again, let's go back to the book here. Dr. Walls got the results that she did and many others in the community have gotten the results by eating more veggies. Veggies have the nutrients that our cells need to heal, to reduce inflammation, to help regulate that immune system, basically discouraging our immune system from attacking our nervous system and healing our gut and healing the brain, all of the things, right? So the veggies eat more of them. Those are the foods that get the results. Spinach, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, asparagus, mixed greens, carrots, beets, berries, lots and lots of veggies and some fruits. So if you learn nothing else from the walls protocol, let it be that. Then we want to reduce the foods that are causing inflammation, gluten, dairy, and sugar. And yes, I recognize that the first two are very hard, but the third one may be one that you're like, I'm not going to fully eliminate it, but I'm at least going to reduce it. Fair game. But these are the primary principles of the Walls Protocol. Obviously, there are different levels to the Walls Protocol, each of which has its own nuances, but these are the main principles. Now, we know that packaged foods, anything in a bag or a box, really don't provide us any nutritional value. And we have been so trained over the years to look at fat and calories and protein and fiber, and those are all good things, but they're not acknowledging the ingredients in there. And that is what is most important important for us from an autoimmune perspective to not just look at the numbers, but to look at what is inside of these foods. And again, we know that they are not going to be the most nutrient dense, but can they help to bridge the gap from eating gluten to not eating gluten? 
And if that is where you are at, that is what is going to be so helpful here. Because if you are having a craving for pasta and it's just not getting satisfied with the spaghetti pasta or those zucchini noodles, they're just not cutting it, you will be far better off opting for a gluten-free pasta than just, again, throwing things to the wind and grabbing the regular box of pasta. Similar with cookies. If it's a decision between regular gluten-containing cookies or waffles or whatever versus a gluten-free option, I'm always going to encourage you to opt for the gluten-free choice. Because we know Gluten can compromise our gut health and contribute to inflammation in our body, even even when you feel fine after eating it. That's one of the most dangerous scenarios, in my opinion. You find so many people saying that they don't feel any different after eating gluten. So they start to wonder, does it really apply to me? I mean, I've eaten gluten my entire life and been fine. So why do I suddenly have a sensitivity to gluten? Why can't I eat it? The truth is gluten is so sneaky. You often won't feel immediate effects from it. However, if you have it on a regular basis, you may start to feel tired, have more headaches, bloated, aches and pains, just blah, and having no idea that it's being caused by gluten. Again, because it's not an immediate response. It's not like somebody who has a peanut allergy and they eat peanuts and they have an immediate response. You're eating something that may contain gluten and you feel fine. You feel fine that day, maybe even the next day. But then as time progresses and as gluten stays in the diet, it doesn't even need to be a lot. It can be a little bit here and there. You start to just like not feel well. And it's so easy to say like, this is just MS or this is just aging or whatever it is that you attribute it to. But that's not always the case. I find so many people in my private coaching practice who are resistant to eliminating gluten and then they finally give it a try and they're like, why did I wait so long? I didn't know how bad I felt until I felt this good. I didn't know how bad I felt until I felt this good. And they often find too that they're like, and I was able to find a lot of swaps. So it doesn't even really feel like I'm craving it anymore. That is the dream. That is fantastic. So let's help get you there if you're not there already. The first thing is, again, going back to those veggies. How can you fill more of your plate with those veggies? I love this crowding out theory because you're focusing on what you're adding in versus eliminating. So can you get more veggies in? And then how can you get some of the gluten and dairy and sugar out of your diet if it's not already out? And then when you look at this from a packaged perspective, like, okay, maybe you've checked those boxes. Now you have some of the um, gluten-free packaged foods in your kitchen. The next time you grab them, I want you to look at the back of the package and read the label. What are the ingredients in this product? Ideally, you should be able to recognize these ingredients. If it's filled with things that you cannot pronounce, or you don't know what they are, or they're super long jumbled names, see if you can find a better option. Because that's just kind of like processed foods one-on-one. We want to make sure that we are getting the best ingredients possible. So how can you find options that have the least amount of ingredients in them and the ones that are most familiar to you? And if you're not familiar with it um, already, if you're not familiar kind of with reading nutrition labels, they are listed in order of quantity. So the first ingredient that is listed is the one that is Um, the highest quantity in that recipe or in that product, the last one has the smallest amount. So if sugar is the number one ingredient, that means that the highest volume ingredient in that product is sugar. (laughs) So first you want to start reading the labels, look at the back of the packages and what actual ingredients are in there. Can you pronounce them? And can you upgrade them? Maybe you're debating between two options and you look at this and you're like, all right, this one has just more, this one has cleaner ingredients. A perfect example of this is I really enjoy tacos. We have tacos in this house and there are gluten-free tortillas that you can get. Um, When I look at the back of the package, there are so many ingredients in there that I can't pronounce and I'm not familiar with. And I'm like, I don't want to eat that. 
that just, I don't care how good it tastes. I'm not going to eat the regular tortilla, but this gluten-free version is packed with just garbage in my opinion. And then I look over and I see that there um, is a corn tortilla and corn tortillas are not as soft as the flour tortillas. I will fully acknowledge that. However, when I look at the back of the package, the ingredients are like corn and maybe like two other ingredients in there. There's so few ingredients. So I look at this and I'm like, is corn something I want to have on a regular basis? No, but I'm not eating tacos every single day. And when I'm looking at the options, I could choose a regular flour gluten containing tortilla. I could get the gluten-free options that have a billion and one different ingredients in there, or I could get the corn tortillas. I opt for the corn tortillas. If I'm making a quesadilla, I choose the cassava flour um, tortillas from Siete. They are fantastic. So that's a perfect example of being able to kind of like look at stepping stones. So that's just a great way of upgrading whatever ingredients you have now. And then I also get asked about specific brands, like what brands do you recommend? I don't know that I could do that like across the board. I will say um, I would really like Siete as a brand for cassava tortillas. They have both the t- tortillas that I would use to make like a quesadilla, um, or last night we actually had enchiladas, or um, they have amazing chips that are pretty clean. So their products, they're gluten, they're dairy, and I'm pretty sure they're all grain-free. But when you look at the ingredients, they're all relatively clean. So Siete is a brand that I like for um, kind of like Mexican type foods. Um, Jovial is a great brand when it comes to um, pasta. So they have a tremendous variety of noodles and they come in both a rice-based option, which obviously it's a gluten-free grain, but they also have a cassava flour option. So that is completely grain-free. We had the cassava flour ones um, this past week. I didn't love them as much as I like the rice base, but if you are trying to avoid all grains, they are a really good option for getting your quote unquote pasta fix. And enjoy life, that's one that's kind of like, it teeters a little bit. Um, they have more of uh, like the the baked goods, the cookies and things like that. They're not perfect, but they are clean on allergies. I think they're um, free of the top nine allergens. So something like that, I am going to have very sparingly. But if I need like a little fix, so to speak, that's my go-to. And I'm curious, what brands do you guys like? Send me them, um, email, DM, whatever you want to do, send it my way because I love having those recommendations because then I can share them um, on future podcasts and in social media and the blog, all the different things. And then last but not least, I also want to encourage you to get in the kitchen and make some simple homemade options. So if you feel like, okay, I graduated from going gluten-free. Check. I did that. And then I took the step of looking at the gluten-free options and I tried to clean them up a little bit. Check. But I still have some packaged foods in there. And maybe you're at the step where you're saying, Aline, I really want to have just more whole foods-based options or just cleaner ingredients make them yourself. You can make things like energy bites, which is basically a combination of some dates. If you use nut butter, you can put that in there. You can put um, tiger nut flour in there. Um, What else do you do? Like cinnamon, uh, shredded coconuts. Like there's, I mean, there's not all of them together, obviously, (laughs) but you can do a combination of a lot of different things so that you can have like a nice little sweet bite that is all pretty much like quote unquote whole foods ingredients. So that would be an option to try to get into the kitchen so that you can make some more homemade options. I have a lot of recipes that I share um, with my private coaching clients as well as um, in the group program that I have done. So if that's something that you need, you can certainly explore those options for support. And then last but not least, pay attention to the results, regardless of what you eat, always pay attention to the results because that is what is going to be most motivating and most insightful for you. I can tell you until I'm blue in the face, all these different things about what gluten does to your body and what artificial sweeteners do and you know all the hydrogenated oils and all of that stuff. 
but it's not until you experience it in your body that it's going to quote that it's going to like click and that's what you need because if you can like get quiet enough to feel a difference in your body paying attention to the day that you eat it the next day and even the days that follow that is when it is most powerful of being able to say like whoa i never realized the subtle difference but i actually do feel a little bloated or i didn't realize this but i am far more constipated when i have the packaged food whatever it may be. Maybe it's headaches. Again, maybe it's aches and pains. Pay attention to the results, even the subtle ones, because that is so motivating for choosing things moving forward. Okay, let's do a quick recap here. First, we want to remember that we are always above everything else prioritizing vegetables. We always want to make sure that we are doing our best even to get just one more serving in each day. And you want to use the gluten-free processed foods sparingly. As I said before, this is going to be different for each person and it's going to be different for each stage that you are at in adopting the walls protocol. But when you are choosing a processed food, you want to read labels, specifically the ingredient list, not the nutrition facts. You want to read the ingredient list. Like I've shared with that example with the corn tortillas, you want to just see like one, two, maybe three ingredients on there. They should be something that you can pronounce and not big long words that you don't know what they are. Because often if you don't know what they are, your body doesn't know what it is. So therefore it will have a harder time digesting it try to get the cleanest options available. Does cross-contamination matter? Most often that is just for people who have more severe allergies, but you get to decide how quote unquote clean you want to be with removing these allergies. My favorite brands, I love Siete, Jovial, Tinkiata is another um, good gluten-free pasta op that I did not mention, but they can be just as good as Jovial as well. Enjoy life. And I didn't mention this, but I did want to add in that I'm not a big fan of the gluten-free version of major brands. Like when major brands just all of a sudden offer a gluten-free option, I find them to be more processed than a brand that is exclusively gluten-free. They tend to be in the um, gluten-free section and they just have more natural options. So that's just a little side note. And then make homemade options when possible. And then of course, pay attention to the results. How do you feel when you eat a certain food? And you may not feel something immediately after. It may be later that day, the next day, or even like the third day. And it may not be just with your digestive tract. You may feel headache. You may feel aches or pains. You may feel like your mood is off a little bit. It may impact sleep. There's so many ways in which food can affect your body. So really pay attention to the results and download a copy of my MS wellness tracker so that you can pay attention to all areas there. Okay. I'm going to wrap this here. There is so much more that I could continue on, but as always, I would just want to give you some quick wins of being able to take one step further with being consistent on the walls protocol. So wherever you are at today, can you get one more serving of veggies in and can you upgrade one food one food that is in your pantry or on your plate or whatever it is can you upgrade just one of those foods to a better quality option well my friend we've reached the end of this episode pick one lesson from today's discussion and put it into action now it's time to reclaim your body mind and life from multiple sclerosis and for more resources events and programs head over to aleenbrennan.com see you on the next episode of my ms podcast